Captain Tachyon, Crowley, Prince, and Jack Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. All right, welcome to Card Table. We're continuing our look at Volume 8, One Eyed Jacks, with the third story, uh, Horses by Lou Shiner. I mentioned last time that it addresses the question that was kind of left open from Volume 5, where Veronica was clearly one of the people who uh, contracted the Wild Cards virus from uh, Typhoid Croyd in Volume 5, and you could kind of imagine and guess that she was going to end up an ace. That seemed pretty likely. Um, even though, <laughs> uh, the odds, theoretically given the, the stated odds canonically, uh, maybe that was unlikely, but in terms of story content, you just kind of had, had a feeling that you were going to, she was going to end up being an ace. Uh, and indeed she does, but that's not really the, uh, point of the story. It, it's more of a character piece where she, uh, the character is a, a, a prostitute and, and her mother was a prostitute, and so she's kind of caught in this life that she doesn't really, doesn't feel good about at all, and sort of finds a way out uh, by find, by uh, meeting a woman named named Hannah, uh, and uh, forming a, forming a romantic relationship with her, um, and then and then the, the the story sort of kickstarts the the whole jumper arc with Hannah being one of the earliest victims of of a jumper crime where somebody jumps into someone's body, commits a crime while they're in that body, jumps back out. And then they've gotten away with it scot-free um, while the, uh, the person who actually <laughs> belongs in the body is now stuck dealing with the consequences. So in the case of Hannah, uh, she goes to jail and then um, she sort of gets jumped a second time so that she can't really testify about her experience. And uh, when she's jumped the second time, she uh, hangs herself, basically. And then the jumper jumps out, leaving Hannah to die. All of which leaves Veronica in a very bad place, which uh, triggers uh, the, uh, I should say, sets off a set of circumstances that triggers her wild card ability. Um, and uh, she, so she sort of becomes an ace and kind of, it's uh, one of those one of those stories where it kind of ends a little bit with a loose end where where, uh, where Veronica sort of swears, sort of swears vengeance, you know, and says um, she's going to find out who did this to Hannah and, uh, and get revenge now that she's an ace and she's capable of doing that. So it leaves you on kind of a loose end, and it's more of a, just sort of a tragic, kind of a tragic love story. And then, uh, like I mentioned with the Walton Simons, Mr. Nobody stuff, um, the payoff really really comes in book nine. Um, uh, and um, in much the same way that Walton Simons and Lou Shiner kind of tied their characters together in the first arc, where Lou Shiner was writing Fortunato, whose arch enemy was the astronomer. The astronomer's kind of number one uh uh, Killer for Hire was Demise, created by Walton Simons. So the, those two authors really tie their characters together. Similar thing happens here, where uh, one of Veronica's clients is Mr. Nobody, the Walton Simons character, um, where he kind of has a a thing for her, and she of course doesn't. She of course doesn't reciprocate those feelings. So that's Horses. Um, the title. Um, there's also a uh, a thread involving Veronica's uh, addiction to heroin. That's where the Horses title comes from. Um, so like I said, it, you know, it's, it's her finding love, uh, getting her life together, uh, dealing with the tragedy of a loss of, of, of her love dying, uh, dealing with addiction. So like I say, more of a character piece. Uh, she doesn't discover her ace power until the end of the story. So it's, I, I'd say it's pretty unusual, an unusual piece for wild cards overall, um, which I like uh, any, any uh, story in wild cards that kind of breaks the usual mold. Uh, is part of part of what makes the overall tapestry that much more compelling. Snow Dragon um, by William F. Wu. Uh, big fan of William F. Wu's work for Wild Cards. Uh, um, this being uh, the first the first contribution, uh, the first uh, story contribution. I think I've mentioned before. Um, a lot of times, uh, a character will show up in Wild Cards that's created by an author who hasn't actually contributed a piece of text yet. Um, Peregrine being a big example. Um, Gail Gerstner Miller created Peregrine, who, who turns up very early in the series, and then you don't actually get a Peregrine story written by Gail Gerstner Miller herself until volume four. Uh, in the case of William F. Wu's Lazy Dragon, Lazy Dragon first showed up in volume five, shows up again in volume seven. 
both times just as a supporting character not written by Wu and then now finally we get to get inside the character's head Ben Ben Choi is is the character's uh, civilian name and it's a good one um I always liked Lazy Dragon. I always thought he was a cool character in the earlier appearances, so it's cool to see him kind of get the spotlight. I, I guess you could argue this one's a little bit of a character piece, too. So the plot of that one involves uh, sort of the, the connection between the Shadow Fists and uh, something going on out in Ellis Island. Um, there are sort of, in the earlier chapters, there are these sort of intimations of what's been going on um, in on, on Ellis Island, where... Uh, the, the, that there are Joker, Jokers sort of squatting there. It's sort of developed a little bit. The, the threat is sort of developed in parallel to the whole jumper threat. And then uh, you sort of realize exactly how they're tied together, uh, where the jumpers are sort of also squatting on, on Ellis Island along with the Jokers. And the Joker community is uh, has a leader uh, called Bloat, who's this sort of very, uh, his Joker mutation has left him very, very... Uh, loaded <laughs> hence the name he's sort of described as uh well he's a teenage boy and he's sort of described as having sort of the upper torso of, of a teenage boy um um perfectly normal and then sort of below the chest is the sort of a uh, huge huge amount of just just huge mass of flesh and fat and bloat um and uh but he's got uh tremendous uh psychic powers even though the bloat is such that at this point he's it's it's gotten to the point where he's pretty much immobile. Um, we're never actually told exactly how he how he got to the rocks. Um, if my pal Greg has uh, has some some interesting theories on it, but but he's on the rocks now. He and he has tremendous psychic power, both uh, telepathic in nature and telekinetic, uh, sort of matter manipulation and stuff. So he can do a lot, and that power has been enough that he's able to uh, sort of gather this community around him. Um, one of his one of his main lieutenants is a character called Kafka, who's a uh, uh, <laughs> cleverly named character, um, where his jokerdom is that he's a giant cockroach. Um, clever stuff. And uh, Kafka, of course, uh, to anyone who's read the early books, who's been, has been around for a while. He's sort of, uh, the idea is that he's uh, got sort of genius level IQ, and he was a very important asset to the Egyptian Freemasons in the, in the earlier uh, in, the, in the earlier couple of books, uh, book two especially, he, he plays a pretty significant role. Um, and then we, he's one of those characters that they sort of uh, take the spotlight away from as far as um, once the Freemason storyline has ended, uh, you could easily be led to, led to think that Kafka is no longer going to play a significant role ever again. But with wild cards, you can never be sure of that. And sure enough, Kafka comes back. And now he's working for uh, Bloat. And then the Joker community. I don't know if it's in the Snow Dragon story uh, where they first use the, use the word rocks, R-O-X, uh, which is their, which is Bloat's sort of name for the, for the Ellis Island Joker community. Um, but it comes up at, at a certain point in volume eight um, where Bloat uh, sort of anytime someone arrives on Ellis Island, he sort of says, welcome to the rocks. Um, and sort of the, it's a sort of nascent uh, Joker nation, if you will. And uh, so the, uh, the setup, as, as we as readers sort of enter the, enter the, uh, the world of volume eight, um, everything's already kind of been established. So the origins are, are sort of left a little bit mysterious as to how everything came together. But at this point, the Jokers and the Jumpers are both on Ellis Island, and uh, the Jokers, apart from Bloat's mental powers, generally speaking, the Jokers are pretty powerless. Um, but the Jumpers, of course, have this incredibly uh, tremendous uh, sort of psychic ability uh, to sort of switch bodies, um, which means they can get away with just about anything. And so they're sort of um, have have earned their place on the rocks, even though Bloat's whole idea is very much. Uh, to create a, a, a nation for jokers um, and isn't really necessarily a big fan of the jumpers, but sees them as kind of a necessary evil. We eventually learn, I guess, I guess we can just spoil this. It's not a huge deal. Um, but Sinjin Latham, uh, another typhoid croid mutation, another one who got his wild card ability from typhoid croid um, is the creator of the jumpers. Um, it's not, it's not, it's another thing that's a little bit shrouded as, as far as uh, how did he learn that uh, he had this ability? <laughs> um, 
where anyone to whom Sinjin um, makes land, uh, they they get this jumper ability. So he he can't jump people himself, <laughs> not in that sense of the word jump, um, but anyone that he has sex with gets the jumper power. And um, in a disturbing twist that uh, is not really too out of character for wild cards in general, there's a lot of disturbing moments, I suppose, in the series. Depending on how, depending on where your threshold is for these kind of things, but uh, Sinjin has a taste for uh, younger folk, <laughs> so that's why all the jumpers are teenagers, um, and he's also uh, doesn't seem too uh, discerning in terms of gender. So there are both female and male jumpers. It's a little bit of a shame that we lose the original Sinjin, who um, was a, a particularly great uh, presence in Volume Three. I always liked sort of the original version of Lupo Latham as uh, the, the ultimate sort of cold fish. Uh, they always describe him as being sort of completely emotionless um, and just uh, stone-faced. Um, and in these, in, in the in the Jumper series, there's a sort of implication that uh, that he actually was as cold as he seemed and, and didn't seem to be at all tempted by the ways of the flesh. And so it really is the wild card mutation that has suddenly given him a sort of uh, sort of kindled a, a carnal appetite in him that he didn't have before. So you do kind of lose what, what I always thought was kind of a cool character, this character who's just sort of completely, uh, <laughs> like, not literally, but very figuratively made of stone, no emotion, no sexual uh, temptation, uh, just like almost like a, uh, almost like a human computer. Um, so now, now, now he's a little different because now he's sort of, this sort of horn dog who uh, is very keen to uh, uh, initiate new jumpers. <laughs> um, I can't remember when it's made explicitly clear that it's that it's Latham. Um, it's certainly you can certainly figure it out from the text in Volume Eight. I can't remember if they ever actually say in Volume Eight that it's him, uh, or if or if they wait until early on in Volume Nine. I feel, I feel like it's, they never explicitly say it here, even though uh, wild cards, um, they do this a lot with wild cards where they really keep that third person point of view to third person limited. Um, so a lot of times it's, they leave it up to reader inference where, um, you know, so if, if you're reading from the point of view of a character who, um, for example, has never met Fortunato and then Fortunato shows up in that story, they're not going to call him Fortunato if you're if you're a third person POV character doesn't know who he is. It's just going to be, and then he saw the the, the this black pimp walking by with a swollen forehead, <laughs> and then you as a reader go, oh, there's Fortunato. So they use that trick a lot, and I, I feel like in this one you sort of have to. It's only through that kind of inference that you know that oh, I get it. It's it's Latham, um, even though I, I think they they sort of don't make that explicit, um, but it's a common trick in wild cards. Uh, just a, just a narrative a narrative conceit that is used over and over in the series. Something that you get used to. One of the things I like about it, actually. So getting back to Snow Dragon. Uh, so Latham, of course, is affiliated with the Shadow Fists, and since the the jumpers are Latham's babies, um, by the by the transitive property, the jumpers are also sort of essentially a Shadow Fist asset as well. And so Lazy Dragon, the star of Snow Dragon, the story in this book, um, he's a Shadow Fist. And so he sort of, uh, essentially he's just, there's not really, again, it's not very plot driven. It's it's more more of a character piece and, and a way to sort of learn more about uh, or start to see more of this this new um, status quo with the jumpers and, and the rocks and everything. So essentially all that happens is that uh, Lazy Dragon is um, tasked by a, a Shadow Fist lieutenant named uh, Christian, I believe, who um, just tasks him essentially with just being a courier and uh, delivering uh, some drugs to the rocks, to Ellis Island. Um, and he has to, since his power involves animating uh, statues that he's created himself, he sort of carves a, uh, a polar bear out of a, uh, out of a bar of soap, which allows him to animate the soap and become a full-size polar bear. And the polar bear swims across the water to Ellis Island and delivers the drugs. Um, and there isn't too much more to it than that in terms of like your basic plot, um, but it's just a way of, of establishing everything because it's our first establishment of the community on Ellis Island and, and another look at the jumpers. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, and getting a little bit into uh, the sort of just the way all these threads are connected, the shadow fists and the jumpers and, and, the, uh, and, and the jokers on the rocks. So, But there is a twist, and this particular twist is one that uh, has always kind of haunted me a little bit uh, because uh, it, they, they still haven't really gone back to it and really fleshed it out, and I, and I keep waiting. I'm hoping, because I know William F. Wu is still a contributor to the series, I keep hoping he's going to come back and, and tell us more about this because uh, it's a very mysterious and kind of unusual situation that he's got going. And it's actually hinted at in his very first appearance. There's a bit in Volume 5 that John Joseph Miller puts into uh, his yeoman story that is the first appearance of Lazy Dragon. Um, there's a bit about how um, Lazy Dragon's uh, aesthetic, if you will, his sort of fashion sense. There's one kind of jarring element to it, which is his pants um, that are kind of this kind of loose, baggy fit. That, um, and it's, it's, it's deliberately pointed out, although it's very, very quick and very, um, it seems like, uh, not at all important. It seems, it, <laughs> again, it's another feature of wild cards that sometimes these things are, are, um, underlined, but there's just so much going on in the series that you just never think that it's necessarily important. Unless they come back to it later in that same book, uh, very easy to forget. And it's not really until you go back and reread that you say, oh, Okay, <laughs> so it's this element that um, very, very brief in Volume Five about about his baggy pants, and then you just kind of think, oh, okay, he's just a guy who wears baggy pants. But it turns out there's more to it than that, which is that Ben Choi, um, he, there's another facet, another um, uh, extra normal facet to him besides just his wild card talent, um, although it's you know still uh, a. It's still obviously uh, meant to be an effect of the virus, but um, all throughout the the text of Snow Dragon, he's hearing his sister's voice in his head, Vivian Choi, and um, it's it's never made totally clear until the end of the story. Um, you sort of you're sort of wondering all through it: is this just sort of like his conscience that he hears in Vivian's voice, or is he actually schizophrenic or multiple personality? Um, um, but it's, it kind of leans towards the former. It kind of leans towards, oh, this is just like, you know, some, like sometimes, you know, your conscience is your grandma's voice or your mother's or whatever. Um, so in his case, it's his sister's and, and you think, oh, that's it. But then it gets kind of, the voice gets more aggressive throughout the story and you think, boy, it's, she sure seems to have a, a mind of her own. <laughs> and then finally at the end of the story is when, um, he wakes up and uh, Vivian is in, in control of the body, and it's it's now her body rather than his, and he is just a voice in her mind. And this is just a thing that happens periodically. We're just told at the very end um, that that uh, this is just a thing that they're both used to, that every so often they switch who's who's the, the driver of the body and who's just in the back of the mind. Uh, and that's why he wears the baggy pants, is, is or, in order to accommodate uh, the wider female hips um, because he never knows exactly when it's going to happen. What a twist. There's clearly uh, more to it. You know, there, there's, there's clearly more going on and, and there's definitely questions that you want to know the answer to um, in terms of, in terms of how this works. And there's a, uh, there's a, a moment, I can't remember if it's in volume eight, it might be later in volume eight or it might not be until volume nine, but um, where they, where they actually say something along the lines of, uh, you know, let's call it Lazy Dragon. No, Lazy Dragon's on one of his hiatuses, or, you know, he's one of his several month long disappearances, or some, something to the effect of the, the, the Shadow Fists, the organization that he does his work for, his freelance work for, are, are sort of used to the fact that sometimes he just goes off the grid. Um, so, so, you know, we get these little hints, and then it's really not until volume 21, Fort Freak, um, where, uh, Vivian Choi turns up again, and she's um, a fairly high-ranking police officer for the 5th Precinct, uh, a.k.a. Fort Freak, the Jokertown Police Precinct. And we get to learn a little bit about her power set, where um, she is a, her mind is able to animate machinery, if as long as it's machinery that she's either messed with herself or built herself, so she can like make little machines, or she can even... Um, if, she, if she does like a tune-up on a car, then her consciousness can inhabit that car. Um, which, of course, is very similar to Ben's ability to um, animate any animal carving that, um, that he's created himself 
so he can inhabit animals and she can inhabit machines. Um, and I know uh, in one of William F. Wu's blogs for Wildcard World, he said that he he based he based that whole idea loosely on a, a pair of siblings from uh, mythology. Um, so yeah, I'd like to know more about that. Uh, <laughs> so William F. Wu, if you're listening and or watching, um, let's do a Zoom interview. <laughs> I'd love to hear more about this whole thing. And I definitely want to see more of the characters in the books and find out what's going on. It's one of the big loose threads. For me personally, one of the ones that most nags at me because I really am curious about how that all, you know, how this all, how, how this all works, you know, and uh, if Vivian's working for this, the law enforcement while, while Ben is a career criminal, how they sort of make that work. And there's just a lot of interesting things there um, that have yet to be fully explored in the text. Um, so I really would like to see that. So, um, yeah, why don't we, uh, why don't we um, end there um, for now? And then we can just continue uh, more, more looking at volume eight uh, in a later video. Uh, yeah, because uh, sort of as we go through the series, uh, there's just more and more sort of density and more things to talk about and the way it relates to previous stories and future stories. So with all that going on, uh, it's just harder to, uh, to sort of encapsulate things uh, more, more easily and more simply. So, um, so we'll end it there for now. And next time we can pick up with... Nowadays, Clancy can't even sing. She doesn't have any class. She says, but what is it? I'm trying to visit with my pal Melinda Snodgrass. Shoot the breeze with Walter John Williams. Hang out with Howard Waldron. I've been smartened for George R. R. Martin. His characters have so much pop. I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. My heart's broken several places. Baby's just sitting there reading about aces.